Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. So today, we are doing the monthly wrap up for the month of August, which means spooky season is coming up. It's always spooky season on my channel, but I am very excited with my month of August. I, I didn't have anything below a three stars. I did have one five star, so very excited about that. And every single book that I read this month is pretty much uh, a cover in the same color scheme, which I am not used to happening. I don't know if I've ever done that before, but that's pretty cool. So we have a lot of red and black with a couple hints of like yellow and white here and there, but that's kind of exclusively the colors of the books that I read. Did not do that intentionally. Uh, and I have five novels today. I did have five novels. I was hoping to get through six, but I am uh, I'm pre-filming and going on vacation for a little bit. So uh, it's currently August 30th and I'm not going to try and squeeze finishing a sixth book in, but I did get through five and we're going to chat about them. I have uh, full length reviews for every single book on this list as well. Um, so if you want real in-depth reviews, I have those. Most of them have a spoiler um, section to those reviews. So I won't do any spoilers um, in my wrap up today. But if you want more in-depth reviews, definitely check out those videos. All right, first up, I finally read Final Girls by Riley Sager. I am a huge Riley Sager fan and I had never read his big breakout novel. Now the only book that I have left in his bibliography is Lock Every Door, which I will get to very, very soon. But yeah, I had to read what the hype is about. So I'm going to read the back of the book for you guys really quickly. Ten years ago, college student Quincy Carpenter went on vacation with five friends and returned alone. In an instant, she became a member of a club no one wants to belong to, a group of similar survivors known in the press as the Final Girls. Lisa, who lost nine sorority sisters to a college dropout's knife, Sam, who went up against the sack man during her first shift at the Nightlight Inn, and now Quincy, who ran bleeding through the woods to escape him. Despite the media's attempts, they never meet. Now Quincy is doing well, maybe even great, thanks to her Xanax prescription. She has a caring almost fiancé Jeff and a therapeutic presence in Coop, the police officer who saved her life all those years ago. Her memory won't even allow her to recall the events of that night. The past is in the past. That is, until Lisa is found dead in her bathtub, wrist slit, and Sam appears on Quincy's doorstep, intent on making Quincy relive the past. And when new details about Lisa's death come to light, Quincy's life becomes a race against time as she tries to unravel Sam's truths from her lies. And remember, what really happened at Pine Cottage before what was started 10 years ago is finished. Okay, so the very first thing that struck me about this book, and again, this is his big breakout novel. This is the novel that so many people, I feel like, first read from Riley Sager. It's probably his best known novel. But what struck me about this book is when I read it, I was like, wow, this really, to me, doesn't read like a typical Riley Sager book. I didn't love it. Um, there, the, our main character I found extremely dislikable. I think the, the kind of vast majority of the characters, to be honest, I found extremely dislikable. I didn't love the kind of lack of action. Everything that was taking place was really just rooted in um, Quincy's apartment, which I found a little bit jarring, um, and I just didn't love the kind of lack of overall slasheriness that this book had. Um, and this is also one of those few Riley Sager books where you're reading it and you just never expect anything supernatural to happen. I'm so used to reading Riley Sager books and thinking, okay, something supernatural seems like it's being set up, but then we're gonna reveal the mystery and it's gonna be this whole wide web of not being that at all and everything's going to connect and it's going to be really really well thought out and really in depth and really crazy really over the top and this really just had kind of like one twist in it just kind of one uh, you could argue that there were multiple layers to that twist but to me it just didn't matter um and I just I found this book fine but just absolutely nowhere near the the level of excellence that I expect now when reading a twisty turny Riley Sager novel. And again, I really hated the main character. I thought she was a bad person. She does a lot of questionable, illegal, awful, selfish things. Um, and at the end, we're kind of just supposed to accept that that's just who she is with like zero consequences. And I didn't love that overall message. I think that Riley Sager since then has gone on to develop really interesting, likable, sympathetic characters um, put in kind of awful, precarious uh, positions. And again, this is like his big like breakout novel, so it's not going to be fine-tuned the way that some of his more recent releases are. But I was definitely let down about uh, by this book. And I totally understand why people who have probably only read this book are kind of like, 
I don't get the Riley Sager hype because if this was the book that I had been introduced to instead of the last time I lied, I feel like I would be in that camp as well. So this was a four star read for me because I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it. It was still like enjoyable. Looking back on it, I feel like I definitely would put it more closer to the three star category, but I rate books the moment I finish reading them because I just put my gut rate in. Uh, looking back, this is definitely more of a three star read for me. It's not bad by any means. It's just not what I expect from Sager. So that's, that's where I'm going to keep that. And I actually have a similar thing to say about my next book, The Old Lady, which is by Christopher Triana. Another one of my favorite go-to authors. I love reading Christopher Triana. Um, and I'm going to read the back of the book really quickly, but this was another book that I just felt like wasn't traditional Triana to me. Um, and not what I'm usually expecting from him as an author. I'm going to read the back. She never wanted to come home. After the death of her estranged father, Tracy returns to the remote cabin she grew up in. As a traumatized veteran of the Vietnam War, Tracy's father subjected her to rigorous survival training under brutal conditions, believing it was for her own good. She escaped and never looked back. Now in her 50s with a criminal record, Tracy returns to claim the property she's inherited. Hiking through the forest, teenage Alicia and her friends get lost in the snow. They snubble upon a compound run by extremists, and when the teens see too much, only Alicia manages to escape. She searches for help and comes across the secluded cabin. With the panic girl banging on the door, Tracy is launched into combat mode, awakening her inner demons. Though she suffers from extreme PTSD, she is skilled in combat, making her a deadly adversary, perhaps too deadly. As a snowstorm hammers down, the women must work together to save Alicia's friends from their captors. Alicia has a protector now. But what if this strange old lady is even more dangerous than the people she's escaped from? So this is by no means a bad book. And I have to preface that going into this. This is by no means a bad book. This is a very well written book. It has a lot of commentary on a lot of things, uh, primarily the political climate of the world. Um, but this is not a book for me. This is a book where the horror in this book is very realistic. It's all rooted in things that could actually happen in extreme circumstances and it is survival horror and you can tell that Christopher Triana knows his stuff he is a um he does write for multiple survival uh publications and like outdoors publications you can tell very much that he knows what he is talking about and is an authoritative figure in this subject matter however not something that I enjoy reading about just it's not really my jam um and like I love reading about scary stories and I love reading about supernatural and I love reading about um like slashers and stuff this just isn't that this is more akin to like an action film um that has a hugely political uh commentary undertone um and again this is that's totally cool Christopher Triana is totally able to share his thoughts on the political climate of America today which he does very very well and very tastefully and it's very laid out and it's very much saying like the world isn't black and white there's a lot of gray in between um and i commend him for that however again just not something i want to read about when i read horror i read for escapism i don't love reading about the horrors of today um i i'd rather read about monsters so again this was just something that didn't work for me one of the things i will say about this is our main character tracy is by far not a hero um similar to uh quincy in uh final girls not a good character. Not a good character. She, You can uh, have sympathy for her and her life and her circumstances, but there's a lot of things that she does where she is not a good character. And in fact, almost every character in this book, I would say, apart from maybe Alicia, morally gray. Morally gray, where most of them tend to lead towards evil, I would say. Um, and I thought that was a really, really interesting thing for Triana to do with this book. Um, I just wish I had appreciated it more because the subject matter and style of this book just wasn't something that I enjoy reading about. So this was a three star for me. And again, not because it's a bad book, not because it's poorly written, not because there's blatant plot holes and I hated everything about it. I appreciate this for what it is. It's just not my kind of book. When I read Triana, I want to read something like Prettiest Girl in the Grave or Ex Boogeyman, where we're going to really amp up the horror and the supernatural and the kind of classic scary story. This to me doesn't necessarily ever need to even be defined as horror and I feel like if this was turned into a film we would have the is silence of the lambs or misery a horror debate that we have so frequently online and this would be one of those books where you're like there's some scary subject matter and some gory scenes but I don't know if it's a horror story and that's how I feel about that book. Three stars. All right next up we have 
Heads Will Roll by Josh Winning. I've never read anything by Josh Winning before. I got this in my most recent Nightworms package and I loved the concept, so I decided to devour this book. I'm going to read the inside flap. After sitcom star Willow tweets herself into infamy and stumbles blind drunk into a swimming pool, her agent ships her off to Camp Castaway. Nestled deep in upstate New York, Castaway is a summer camp for adults who are desperate to leave their mistakes behind. No real names, no phones, no way to call for help. Willow's fellow campers seem okay. Her own favorite actress is even here, making a s'more. And did that jaded writer Danny just wink at her? But the peaceful vibe is shattered when one of the campers vanishes and Willow finds a mutilated doll's head in her room with a threatening message rolled up inside. Tara grips the root. Campers begin to lose their heads, literally, and disturbing past deeds come to light. Is Willow about to get canceled all over again? This time, for good. I was so on board with this book for the first like two thirds. I thought this book was funny. I thought this book was weird. I thought this book had like a really interesting social commentary on cancel culture told through this like just ridiculous rich person summer camp, uh, like retreat style thing. I don't even know what I would call it. Um, and I was like so into it. I, I was like chuckling along. I loved the structure. I thought the characters were interesting. I was like trying to figure out what like was actually going on behind closed camp doors, whatever you want to say. And then I got to the last third where like everything that this book had like really nailed for me just completely unraveled and fell apart. Um, and that kind of crushed my soul. I hated the twist. I hated the plot holes. I hated the open-endedness. Um, which I don't even know if it meant to be open-ended. Like there was just so many plot holes in the story that I was like, was that open-ended or was that something that we just like forgot about and just, you know, abandoned that storyline. Um, and that sucked. That sucked because it had so much potential. And I have a whole in-depth review where I kind of break down the plot holes and my whole, all of my grievances with this story and how it starts off by sending a really amazing message and then because of the conclusion kind of takes that whole, the whole point of the book away. Um, I feel like Josh Winning just got really, really lost in what he was trying to do and trying to say to make a compelling kind of twisty, turny story a la Riley Sager. Um, and I wish he had just kind of not done that. I wish he hadn't pulled the rug for, uh, out from under us and kind of created this like really over the top end um, and instead just kind of stuck to very like bare bones storytelling um, and given us just a point A to point B plot because I think it would have nailed the message he was trying to send much, much more. That being said, there's funny moments in this scene. There's absurdist moments in this. Uh, there's very funny moments um, in this book. There are very absurdist moments in this book. There's a lot of gore. Um, there's like one scene of like, like great imagery and like body horror. And I, I really enjoyed the imagery evoked there. Um, and I loved the concept of nobody using their names and, but because everybody is so famous, you can probably figure out who they are and like kind of using that against each other while still hiding their own identities. I really loved a lot of that in the story. I just think it got very, very lost towards the final third and wanted to kind of be this like insane oh my god I can't believe that's what happened moment and it didn't work because it just kind of overshadowed all of the like hidden gems that made it so great up until that two-thirds mark so yeah three stars for me we'll definitely probably read more from Josh winning but I need some improvement on the the final storytelling okay next up Clown in a Cornfield 3, The Church of Frendo. I'm not going to read the back of this book um, just because it'll probably have spoilers for books 1 and 2. And if you haven't read books 1 and 2, don't want to ruin that for you. Especially because book 1 is so good. It is so good. This is the continuing story of Quinn Maybrook. She, uh... She is a main character in the slasher novel Clown in a Cornfield 1, which is a true, amazing, fun, campy slasher story. It's marketed as YA. All of these books are. They are not YA. I do not understand why they are marketed as YA. They're extremely gory. They have very adult topics in them at times. Um, they are not YA. So don't ever be discouraged from reading the original Clown in a Cornfield because it's in the YA section. It's not. There's teenagers are the main characters, like any slasher, but that, that's literally it. Um, but yeah, this is a this is a continuation. Um, 
it's better than book two. I hated book two. I think book two lost all of the fun campiness of book one. Um, removed the entire concept of being a slasher story and decided to make it this kind of, again, political commentary. We have a lot of like themes going on with my books this month. That was all unintentional. Um, this one definitely toned down the blatant regurgitation of the political climate being copy and pasted from real life into a murderous clown story. Um, but not entirely. There's still a lot of that kind of notion. I will say you could probably read this as a standalone or you could probably read book one, skip book two, maybe just read the inside flap of this book, probably be caught up on what happened to book two and then read book three and be fine. And the reason I say that is because the there's virtually no main characters from books one or two apart from Quinn who are even present in book three. And if they are, it's like an aside. Um, there's a ton of new cast of characters in here, just pretty much everybody for the most part. And the few that aren't new, who I had to like dig deep into my memory to figure out who these people were because I don't remember them being previous main characters. Um, but I will say this is a very fun and interesting way to do a cult. Um, it's got some very gory scenes, it's got some very graphic scenes, it's got some very disturbing scenes, which I did feel were lacking primarily in book two, but were definitely for the most part present in book one. It's definitely very serious, while at the same time a main character is like a 17 year old juggalo, kind of really leaning into the fact that he's a juggalo in a story about clowns. Like, it's very very tongue in cheek and he's actually the best character in the book. Um, but it's just a little bit of a weird tonal shift, especially the juxtaposition between our main character being, again, somebody that we've spent three books with now, this juggalo character, Johnny D, and then we have this other character, Tabitha, who's an extremely devout religious figure. Um, a religious follower, I guess is the right way to say it. And it, it all kind of works in a way Except for the fact that I just hate the main character of this book. Like, she's fine in book one, and I'm not a fan in book two. And by book three, I'm just like, I don't want anything to do with you. But everything else kind of around her is interesting enough. And the commentary on, like, extreme religious fanatics uh, to a point of leading to harm to others is a really interesting commentary that I'm kind of like, okay, this is, like, worth reading. Uh, so I give this a four stars because... It's slowly kind of going back to the greatness that was book one. It's removing itself from the disappointment that was book two. And it has some moments that I really enjoyed. And I read it very, very quickly. But it's still, like, I'm still chasing the, the momentum and joy that I had with book one and hoping that'll be recaptured in one of these books. And it's just not. And there's already setting up for a book four, and Adam Cesare is planning on writing a book four, as he says in the afterword in this. So, like, this is just going to keep going, and I'm probably just going to keep reading them, because I've just accepted... I don't know, maybe I won't read them. I don't, it's, it's like disappointment all the time, because I just want it to be as good as the first. But, I mean, like, you have to get to Jason Takes Manhattan, that's part eight. Um, and to get to another, like, just, like, ridiculous Friday the 13th that I love. So, like, I don't know, maybe Clown in the Cornfield 8 will be fantastic. I don't know. At least we're going in a better direction than we did with book two. I really didn't like book two. I was so disappointed in that. But there, there's moments in this. I, I definitely recommend watching my in-depth review because I'll really highlight what did and didn't work for me in that book. Okay, and then last but not least, on a clear day, you can see Block Island by Gage Greenwood. I loved this book. I'm just gonna come out and say it. My last video up was the full review of this. I loved this book. Ah, it was so good. It was so unexpected how good it was. I just got this in my Twisted Retreat box. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful edition. It's really creepy. This cover makes so much sense once you read the book. Um, yeah, I, I'm having a hard time speaking about this book because I don't want to ruin anything about it. And I went in very, very blind to this book, and I think I got more out of it by knowing less. I'm going to read the back. Uh, four years after the Keating family endured the darkest experiences of their lives, the children are still fighting to move on. Charlie's anxiety has control of his life. Angela is afraid of the dark. Brian suffers from a drug addiction. 
Chrissy struggles to remember what happened to them, the details forever haunting the outskirts of her mind. But when new information comes to light about what they had witnessed, they make a plan to escape their problems once and for all. Sometimes the only way to confront your demons is to face them head on. So the Keating siblings decide to go back to the island and call their monsters out of the darkness. Soon they realize the terror awaiting is much more than they bargained for. If you like Anya Allborn, if you like familial horror, if you like stories that don't have happy endings, read this. Read this. I, I really don't want to say too, too much about it. This is a creature feature done extremely well. The lore fully fleshed out. It will rip your heart out. Um, it's going to be very dark. It's going to stay very dark. Um, and I loved every bit of it. I loved the, the commentary on grief that this book shares with us. I loved how, uh, I loved the changing perspectives of the story. I said this in my full review, but there's no singular main character. It's kind of dependent on where we are that a main character kind of shines through for a moment before passing the torch somewhere else. And I loved that about this book. I thought it was so well done. I thought it was beautiful. I thought the setting was incredible. I thought the monsters were terrifying. Uh, I had very little grievances with this book. Um, I talked about this in my, my big review, but um, the, the monster's weakness just was very, very cliche to me. And it's been done so many, many times that that was the only thing that I was like, I really wish we had done something different with that. I thought that would have been more interesting. Um, but really beyond that, I have very little negative things to say about this book. I thought this was fantastic. Please go into this book blind. Um, because I feel like the more you know about it, the more the twists and turns and the the gut-wrenchingness of this whole book will wear off. Um, again, I, I literally, all I knew is that this book is very heartbreaking and that what I said on the back of the book is what it's about. The opening scene I was stunned by. Um, I can only imagine the opening scene being on film and just the audiences just like losing their mind that that happened. And then you get like four more scenes like that throughout the story. Um, the stories uh, of with Brian, Charlie, and Jackson I thought were so fantastic and so depressing and so very, very real. Um, there are all three characters who a lot of their issues really are rooted in reality and PTSD and they all handle it very, very differently. Um, and I just, I felt like for the most part, their, their stories, even if you take the supernatural elements out, could still be told and are just so heartbreaking. Um, and too, when you look at the relationships with uh, Christy and Angela, I, I really loved the dynamic between the two of them because again it's something that I think is so very real um but also very tragic at the same time uh the nothing happens to the dog I want to say that uh definitely read the afterword in this about why there's a dog included in this book it's really really sweet and I kind of loved it um so if you're somebody who's like worried about animals and stuff like that don't worry like nothing happens to the dog just Make sure you read the afterword too and it'll explain a little bit more and it's actually very very cute and heartwarming in a book that is so depraved and depressing. Uh, so yes, please read this. Five stars, five stars. This is one of those, after I finished reading this I felt the way that I felt um, about only a few other books this year where I'm just like this is definitely in my top five reads of the year so far. Like I was blown away and I didn't expect to be. I really didn't expect to be. I didn't expect too much out of it apart from the fact that I was like kind of pumped that it was set in like Rhode Island. Um, anyways, that is all that I have for you guys today. I have five books here. Again, I got one five star, two four stars, two three stars. I didn't hate any of these books. I had my own issues and discrepancies with them. Um, and I do really just love how, like, all of the cover art is kind of the same color scheme. I thought that was really fun. But yeah, that is what I have for you guys. Um, September is going to be a little weird for me just because I'm going to be out of the country. I'm going to try and read as much as possible. Hopefully I'll get to four, maybe six books, hopefully. Uh, but we will see. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. As always, I try to post every Monday and Thursday, sometimes on Saturdays. And if you enjoy these videos, please hit the like and subscribe buttons down below. And I will catch you on the next one. Mwah!